Turn in your Bibles, if you will please, to the book of 1 John. This is part four of a series of messages on the Word of God. Part four of a series of messages on the subject, the Word of God. And there's so many places that I could begin today, but uh, I just felt this is where the Spirit of God would have me to go. Folks, if, <clears throat> if that book in front of you is not trustworthy, we are all wasting our time. However, I'm convinced that we have in front of us today the very words of our Creator. And I want to talk to us about it, but I also want to give us some historical background information that will help us to understand some of the footnotes that takes place in our Bibles. And even in good Bibles, people have been sold a bill of goods. And therefore, I want to be able to talk to us about it today. First John chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, good to see you again. Thank all of you for being in your places today. I hope you'll be back tonight. Uh, in the house of God. I'm going to continue this series tonight, may conclude it tonight. I haven't decided yet, but it's so vitally important that we know that we don't have to apologize for this book in front of us. Uh, you go to the bookstore and you overhear the conversations. I was in a bookstore not that long ago and uh, I overheard a conversation between the clerk in the bookstore, and somebody just walked in the door and they wanted to purchase a Bible. And they said to the person who was the clerk, uh, what Bible do you recommend? And the clerk recommended an off-of-the-wall version of the Bible. And I, I listened to the conversation. I got in, in, in close enough where I could eavesdrop. I wanted to see what that conversation consisted of. And I heard this phrase, well, this version here is nearest the original. Uh, this, verse, this version here is easiest to understand. Uh, the, the, the customer said, what about the King James Bible? Oh, that's too difficult. So when the customer left, I decided it was time to become a second customer. And so I went over and I said, could you tell me why you sold that person that particular Bible? And they gave me the same runaround. I said, are you aware of the fact that the Bible you sold that person has deleted at least 40 verses of Scripture out of that Bible? 40 complete verses are missing. Oh, I don't believe that. I said, well, let me show you picked up the King James, picked up the version of the Bible, and I started showing, I didn't know that. I said, yeah, ignorance is bliss when it comes to the Word of God. Now, I want to say this. It needs to be said. I want to say it again. I learned a long time ago that when I say I believe that this Bible we have in front of us is the Word of God, I don't, I don't want to believe it because I heard somebody say it. I want to know why I believe it so. And I've spent a lot of time studying this subject, and I've got dozens and dozens of books, and I've taught this in the Bible college, and, and I've taught it in my Sunday school class for over a year, and I've studied it diligently for nearly 50 years. I'm not bragging. I'm not a novice at this, but I want you to know I've got the truth about it. I can defend why I believe the King James Bible is God's special word to the English speaking world. I want to take a little time this morning and I want to cover some of that material for us 
so that when somebody comes up to you and they say, well, well, you go to that old, uh, they call it the Breen Baptist Church over there where they still have that old timey stuff, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, we plead guilty to that. Yeah, yeah. So I know why I believe what I believe, and I want you to know why you believe what you believe. The secretary just destroyed it here. She done got me up. Now I had to go with the clock. She just put batteries in. Now, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 1. I have to let Jackie finish preaching. Now, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Uh, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now, I want you to hold on to a little phrase here. I'm going to come back to it in a few minutes. It's easy for us to read over truth and never let truth take. In verse number one, I want you to notice this phrase. Jesus is the Christ. Now, there was a reason why John was writing this letter. There was heresy abroad in that day. I'll talk to you about it in just a minute, but I want you to see it in this verse. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to exegete a little. No, Jesus is the Christ. Look at verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. I want you to notice two things. I got you standing here so you stay away. But I want you to notice two truths here. Don't miss it. If you're saved, God has birthed you. I'm looking at you today. You're looking at me because my parents birthed me. Your parents birthed you. You are in on planet earth today because your mother birthed you. You are here today because of a birth. If you go to heaven, you have to have a birth of God. And if you'll notice in verse number one, it says Jesus the Christ is, look at this, born of God. You have to be born of God if you go to heaven. And look at verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God. Now the first birth gets us on planet earth. The second birth gets us in heaven. Now watch this. Verse number 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth, watch this closely, He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Important. Hold on to that. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record. That God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name 
of the Son of God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Make an application, I pray, to our hearts today. In Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Several times as you read the Word of God, you will find, depending on the version of the Bible you have in front of you, you will find the phrase, this verse, or these verses, are not in the oldest manuscripts. I will say it again, there will be a footnote. There will be a side note in the margin of your Bible, and it will say, this verse or these verses are not in the oldest manuscript. In other words, they are hoping to illuminate you. They are hoping to educate you. They are hoping to say to you, we want you to understand, we put it in there, but it was added later on after the originals by some scribe, but in reality, it should not be in the Scriptures. Now, another way they, the reason they're doing this is they are, uh, they are really trying to apologize that they are so learned and we're so way, way, way down the totem pole that we just don't understand. So they're trying to put the cookies on the bottom shift so that we can better understand that certain passages of Scripture in reality just should not be in the Bible. Now, there are several places you'll find that as you read the Word of God. For instance, if you read the Gospel according to Mark, you will find that in the last chapter, the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, there are several verses there that uh, you find a little side margin or a footnote that will say about, I guess, five or six verses of the last chapter of Mark. They will say these verses are not in the oldest manuscripts. Now, you'll also find that in our text verse today. Many of your Bibles, even your good Bibles, They've gotten caught up in this. They will say that the oldest verse, like verse number 7, they will footnote it. Now, they'll keep it in there. Some Bibles will take it completely out. But they'll keep it in there, and then they will apologize for keeping it in there. They will have a little footnote down there or something in the side margin, and they will say that this verse or these verses is not in the oldest, and catch the phrase, the oldest manuscripts. So they footnote it out. Now, I want to take just a moment, and I want to define for us, historically and biblically, what we are actually talking about when we say oldest manuscripts. Beyond that, let's just consider for a minute what is a manuscript. A manuscript originally was the Word of God as it was written on parchment or vellum. However, whatever writing materials they had, they, it was given by inspiration to those writer, writers and it came in the form of a manuscript and then a manuscript was handed on and handed on and it went through this person, that person, changing the language and whatever so that the Word of God could get to the people of the world. But when it says this is not in the oldest manuscript, it is not talking about the original writings as we know them on those original parchments. The Word of God in the year 1881 took on a tremendous change. In 1881, two men called Westcott and Hort began to tamper with the Greek language. When they finished with it, they changed the language, the text, 8,000, 
and 400 times. Now, what text did they use? It is the text that is footnoted in your Bible, probably right in 1 John 5, 7. It's footnoted there. It's footnoted again in Mark, Mark chapter number 16. When they say that these verses, hear me well, I'm just, I'm just playing right now. I'm going to start preaching here in a minute. When they say these verses are not in the oldest manuscripts, they are talking about two manuscripts. The first manuscript they're talking about is the manuscript which was found in a Catholic church. It was called the Vaticanus. It was discovered in the Pope's library in the year 1481. Now, I want to say that again because this is vitally important. When they say, I'm repeating myself because I want you to get it. When they say that this verse of Scripture or these verses of Scriptures are not in the oldest manuscripts, they are talking about, first of all, a Catholic writing. They're talking about a manuscript found in the Catholic uh, church in the Pope's library, now catch the year, in the year 1481. There's another manuscript they are referencing. It is called Sinaiticus. Sinaiticus. It was discovered in 1859 in a trash can at a monastery on Mount Sinai. Now, when you read in your Bible that these verses are not in the oldest manuscripts, those are the manuscripts they are referencing. Both of them are Catholic in nature. Both of them were found either in 14, the year 1481, or in the year 1859. Now, in the book of 1 John, chapter 5, verse 7, you have that footnoted in many of your Bibles. They will say that this verse is not in the oldest manuscript. Here's what they're saying. This verse was not in the manuscript found in the Catholic Church. They're saying that this verse was not in the Vaticanus, the Sinaiticus, the two books that came out of the Catholic Church. Now, hear me well. The oldest date being 1481 from us, and the other date, 1859. They said this verse is not in those manuscripts. However, I want you to stay with me now for just a moment. In the year 150 A.D., in other words, 150 years on the other side of our Savior, Hear me, close, hear, me, hear me well, 150 years on the other side of our Savior, not 1,481 years and not 1,859 years, but right down within 150 years of when Jesus walked on the top side of this earth, Tertullian quoted this verse in its entirety as it is found in your Bible today. Now, when they say that this verse is not in the oldest manuscript, as far back as they can go is 1,481. But had they gone back to 150 A.D., they would have found this verse. Now, what are they doing? They are basing the oldest manuscript on a faulty set of manuscripts. They are basing their thinking on manuscripts that was tinkered with, they are basing their, their scriptural interpretation upon something that came out of Catholicism. I don't want the Catholic Church to tell me where the Word of God is or isn't. Because they are a religion of works. They believe that you're saved by doing things. We believe you're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what happened, these two manuscripts were the two manuscripts that two men, I'm going to talk about them later, but not this morning. 
These manuscripts were the manuscripts that two men called Westcott and Hort used when they when they put the they they changed the the language and they and they put other manuscripts out there. Listen closely. That all of the modern Bibles today come from. Now the reason there are omissions in different Bibles, and the reason there are verses left out, the reason there are wording left out, well, for instance, in the New International Version, there are 40 complete verses found in your King James Bible that are not found in the New International Version. 40 verses completely just like you take an eraser and erase them out of the Word. Forty verses are gone. Why are they gone? Because the manuscript it came from was not the same manuscript that the King James Bible came from. The King James Bible came from what was called the received text dating back to the days of Christ, a pure line. God kept it pure. God kept it powerful. God kept it clean. So it comes straight from the days of Christ. But over here you have the Vaticanus, Vaticanus, the Sinaiticus, uh, and then two men, Westcott and Hort, in 1881, took that text, put it out there, and every Bible today outside of the King James Bible comes to you by the Catholic Church, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, through Westcott and Hort, who changed the Greek text eight thousand and four hundred times. You want to know why there's 40 verses left out? It came from Vaticana, uh, Vaticanicus and Sinaiticus. Uh, it came through Westcott and Hort. You want me to tell you why the name of Jesus in the NIV, and this is true in most liberal Bibles, the name Jesus is removed, left out of the Bible 30 eight times. Uh, you want to know why uh, the name Christ is removed out of the new Bibles 43 times? Let me tell you why. They came out of the Catholic Church. The, the manuscript Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, uh, Westcott and Hort gave the text for every modern version of the Bible today and they have literally raped the scriptures. Now, the average person that reads the liberal Bible will never know how many times the name Jesus is not found in there. You know why? The devil's deceptive. You'll never know how many times the word Lord is not found in there. You'll, not find, you'll never know how many times the word Christ is not found in there. But people that have taken time to compare the text have understood and found out that the liberal Bibles, they omit Jesus, they omit Lord, they omit Christ, and dozens of times they take, listen closely, they take the name hell out of the text. The liberal Bibles dozens of times uh, will subtract out, delete out the word hell. Why do they do that? Well, the devil don't want to put any emphasis on the place lost people are going. The devil is a deceiver. The devil wants a version that can bring all of the religions of the world together and feel comfortable about it. Now, your Bible has got all of these verses in it if you've got the right Bible. Your Bible has these words in there if you've got the right Bible. But these other versions are taking them out because the, this Bible that I have in my hand comes from one spring flowing from the days of Christ. God kept it pure. The liberal Bible on this side flows through Catholicism, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, Westcott, and Hort. That's the reason for the deletions in the Bible. It is not the right manuscript. It is a faulty line it is coming through. Now, why does the devil hate it? Why does the devil hate this verse here in 1 John? Well, let me help you with it for just a moment. You remember just a few minutes ago, I said I wanted you to look at the word Jesus and Christ. I want you to notice how often uh, that it was used there. It's vitally important that you understand something that's happening here. When John wrote this Bible, there was a group, or this verse, this very part of the Bible, there was a group of people in John's day who taught that Jesus Christ was just an ordinary person. Here's what they said. 
They said that Jesus Christ became the Christ at his baptism. They said when the Holy Spirit descended, descended upon him, when John was baptizing him, that that was the Christ descending upon Jesus. Then they said on the cross, the Christ left him. They said when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That that was the point when the Christ left him. In other words, they're trying to say that Jesus Christ is just an ordinary run of the mill, uh, another Adam, a man of sin, nothing super duper about him, nothing unusual about him, nothing powerful about him, nothing divine about him. He was just another member of Adam's race. They're teaching that Jesus Christ uh, was nothing more than a heretic who claimed to be God. That's the reason John writes these verses of Scripture. And that's the reason he said in verse number 1, He that believeth that Jesus is the Christ is what? Is born of God. If Jesus is not the Christ, there's no divine birth. If Jesus is not who he claimed to be, there's no salvation. If Jesus Christ is not able to forgive sin, then we're all still in our sin. So on, in this passage of Scripture, he is saying to that group of heretics, uh, I want you to know in verse number 6 that he, this is he that came by water and blood. Here it is again. Even Jesus Christ. He's pushing the fact that Jesus was and is the Christ. He was the Christ from the time he was right there in the manger scene of Bethlehem. He was Christ when he walked among men. He was Christ when he did miracles. He was Christ when he walked on the water. He was Christ uh, when uh, he taught uh, like no man's ever taught. He was Christ. He was the Son of God when he hung on the cross. He was the Son of God in the tomb. And thank God he proved himself in Romans chapter 1 to be the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus is the Christ. It didn't come on him. It was on him when he got here. And it didn't leave him on the cross. He died for your sins and my sins. And he died as the God-man, the Son of God. Very God of very God. Now John gives us testimony to prove that Jesus was the Christ in the true word of God. Notice what he said. He takes us to heaven to get witnesses to Jesus, and then he brings us down here on earth to give us witness that Jesus was the Christ. Notice with me, please, in verse uh, number 6, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now notice he said he came to us by water. What is that a reference to? It is a reference not by what those people believed, but when Jesus was baptized, it was acknowledged by the Father. When the heavens opened up, and he said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit of God came down. But it was not that he was beginning to be the Christ. He was already the Christ. And the Father said, I want you to know, there at the baptism, this is my Son. But not only did he come by water, but he came by blood. What's that a reference to? It's a reference to Calvary. Because on the cross of Calvary, the Bible said that the endless line of sacrificial animals in the Old Testament had a period placed on them. Not a comma, but a period. The Bible said, for we know that the blood of animals and sacrifices can never take away sin. The priest in the Old Testament, if you study the Old Testament scriptures, you'll find in the tabernacle and in the temple, there was never a chair. Why? 
because the work was never done. The Old Testament priest could never sit down. He was constantly going to the brazen altar. He was constantly uh, going to the table of shoe bread. He was constantly going to the lava. He was constantly going to the lampstand. And once a year he would go into the Holy of Holies and take the blood of an innocent animal to atone for the children of Israel for that year. And it was a constant thing. Animals were constantly slain. Uh, the Bible said in the morning they'd take an animal and slay it and put it on the brazen an altar uh, and then of the night they do the same thing. There had to be a constant offering offered up all of the time for the sins of the people uh, and once a year they would take the blood of the slain animal into the holy place and appease God for another year but he said we know that those animals could never take away sin. Uh, oh but listen about the Lamb of God. Uh, John said behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The Bible said in the book of Hebrews that he entered in one time uh, uh, listen, he entered in once into the holy place, uh, having obtained eternal redemption for us. There was a woe put on the animal sacrifices uh, because the Christ, the Son of God, came along. Uh, and when he died, uh, not only did he die for us, the Bible in the book of Hebrews and the book of the Romans uh, teaches us uh, that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, went back and took away all of the sins of those in the Old Testament who were saved on credit, they, their sins were atoned for. That means they were momentarily covered, but when Jesus died, he not only provided the blood for the future, he provided the cleansing for all of those who were saved by credit in the old. The blood of Jesus Christ, my friends, goes from one end of creation to the other because there's nothing like the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's powerful blood because he's the Christ. He's the son of living God uh, and the water and the blood, and then he said thirdly, and the Spirit testify. These three testify that Jesus is the Christ. But he takes it a step farther. In verse number 7, this is the verse. They footnote, and they say it's not in the original. Wonder why? Tell you why? They don't want to acknowledge the fact that Jesus is the Christ. For there are three that bear record in heaven. There's the Father. The Father said, this is my beloved Son. Hear ye him upon the Mount of Transfiguration. Up in heaven the Father is saying, he's my Son. And secondly, the Word is testifying, I'm God because I'm here with the Trinity. And then thirdly, in verse number 7, the Holy Ghost. And these three are in agreement that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Holy Spirit placed that seed in the body of Mary. He ought to know. The Holy Spirit's been around since Jesus decided to vacate heaven and come down here for 33 and a half years. And the Spirit of God ought to know. Up in heaven, they're testifying that Jesus is the Christ. And down here on this earth, they're testifying that Jesus is the Christ. No wonder the new versions of Bibles uh, don't want that testimony because it testifies conclusively that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Savior of the world. Very God or very God. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. As the old country fellow said, this is getting gooder and gooder. If there's testimony in heaven that he's the Christ, if there's testimony on this earth that he's the Christ, then in verse number 9, why can't we believe it? Because we take people at their word because he said in verse number 9, if we receive the witness of men, in other words, somebody says to you, I'll be at your home tomorrow at 9 o'clock. You plan for them to be there. They plan to be there. If somebody says to you, I'll meet you next week. You plan to meet them next week. They plan to meet you next week. Uh, somebody on the job says, if you want to come in Monday, you've got a job. You take them at their word. They take you at your word, and you go in. I, are, you, are you with me? We, we take each other's word. We function on behalf of what somebody promises us, or we promise them. But man is weak. It may be that 
you make a promise to meet somebody, and it may be that you get sick, they get sick, you, came for, you meant well, you fully intended to do it, but all of a sudden something arises, something comes up, you can't meet them. Wait a minute, we still function on the witness of men even though man is so weak and so undependable at times. It's amazing. The church voted to do some work here in the auditorium. We've been in touch with the company. Let me show you how fallible and weak, man. We called the company. Took them two weeks to return a phone call. They set a date to come by. They canceled the date. Gave us a second day. Came by, just had a handful of stuff. Wasn't, wasn't anything we could look at. He said, I'll see you to middle of next week. Middle of next week never came. Never came. I called back, talked to the man over him. He said, well, I'm sorry he didn't do what he said he'd do. He said, I promise you that me or him one will be in touch with you today. The day went by, never heard a word. I finally called and talked to the owner of the company, told him what was going on. I've been promised, been promised, been promised. He said, he said I promise you, this was on Tuesday. He said, somebody will be in touch with you tomorrow, Wednesday, or Thursday. That's been two weeks ago. I hadn't heard a thing. Now, man will make promises that he don't keep. I'm going somewhere with this. This will bless you. You just hold on a minute. Man will make promises that he don't keep. And we work. We function on behalf of promises that people don't keep. Because all we've got in this world, people. Somebody said the world would be a good place if it wasn't for people. But people have fallen nature, fallen Adam's race is all we have to deal with. But we take each other at their word, even though they're fallible. Verse number nine, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. If man tells you he'll do something, he may do it and he may not do it. But there's a witness in heaven that says Jesus is the Christ. There's a witness on earth that says Jesus is the Christ. And the Bible says if we function in this world on behalf of what men tell us they'll do, you can rest assured to a further degree, you can function on what God tells you he will do in his word because God's witness is greater than our witness. That's the reason you can hang your soul on the nail of eternity because that nail won't come off the wall. Now watch it, watch it. We're going somewhere. We're not there yet. We're on the highway. We're getting in the city limits. I want you to watch something. We receive the witness of men, the witness of God's greater. What's he doing? He's talking about witness. In heaven, they witness that Jesus is the Christ. When Jesus was down here, this world witnessed and testified that Jesus is the Christ. Although verse number 7 is uh, uh, talked about uh, in the old ancient manuscripts, and it really shouldn't be in here. He said, wait a minute, I want you to know, yes, he should. Up in heaven they said it, down here they said it, and we receive in the witness of men. The witness of God is that he has, he has testified of his son. Now watch verse number 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Now here's what he's been doing. He's trying to get us to be witnesses to the fact that Jesus is the Christ. Now that we are born of God, verse number 1 and verse number 4, when we get saved, God says, He that believe on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Now watch this closely. He that believe not God hath made him a liar. Because he believed not the record that God gave of his son. There is a record here. And God has said we can believe the record because heaven up there has already said he's the Christ, the son of God. And when he got down here, the water and the spirit and the blood said that he was the son of God. Uh, and they try to take it out. They, don't want, they think that uh, they're right in line with those false teachers that he became the Christ after he got here and, he, and the Christ left him on the cross. Oh, no, no. He said, wait a minute. He that believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born He's born of God. How do we know that? Because God witnesses to that fact. Uh, and in verse number 10, uh, he says, if you believe on him, you have the witness in yourself. If you don't believe on him, you are L-O-S-T, lost. 
Now, God said there's a record about the son. I want you to watch it. Verse number 10, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believed, here it is, he believed not the record that God gave of his Son. God has given a record of who his Son is. Up in heaven, there's a trinity. They're all in agreement that Jesus is Son of God. When he got down here, there's a trinity of, of words there in verse 7, taken out of the liberal versions of the Bible, but it's still in the original text that says, down here, the Christ didn't come on him. Uh, he was Christ when he got here. He didn't leave him at the cross. He died as the, uh, on the cross. And this is the record that God wants you to know that his Son is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you can believe on him to the saving of your soul without any question mark whatsoever. It's the record. Now he wants us to know what the record is. In verse number 11, and this is the record. Here's the totality, he said, of what I'm saying. This is the record. That God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. Up in heaven, they said he's the Christ. When he got down here, the true word of God said he's still the Christ. He didn't lose a thing by coming down here. When he got down here, he was still the Christ. And here is the record. If you believe on this Christ, you have eternal life. If you refuse to believe on this Christ, you have eternal death. But the record is, he that hath the Son hath life. Now hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Look at this. This is the record that God hath given us eternal life. Now he said this life, watch this, this life is in his Son. Where is life in Jesus? Where is eternal life in Jesus? Heaven says he's the Christ. Earth says he's the Christ. And the person who's been saved says he's the Christ. Because you have the witness inside. Why is the Bible so important? Because the Bible is the book that teaches us how to get to the Savior. Turn with me in closing to the book of 2 Timothy. Back to the book of 2 Timothy. Here's the reason the devil hates the Bible. Here's the reason he wants footnotes to apologize for key verses of Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse number 14, Paul writing to the young preacher Timothy, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Look at verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known thee, notice what it says, not just scriptures, but holy scriptures. That Bible in front of you is a holy book. Listen closely. Hear me. He was basically referencing the Old Testament Scriptures because the New Testament canon has not been written. And he said that the Old Testament books are holy Scriptures. Watch this next phrase which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. What does the Word of God do? It makes you wise about your need to be saved. Paul said, Timothy, these are holy scriptures, and the purpose of these holy scriptures is to make you wise about who you are, who he is, and how you can get to him. You didn't get convicted to get saved by reading a Bugs Bunny comic book. 
You didn't watch Matt shoot the outlaw on the streets of Dodge City while Doc and Kitty stood on the sidewalk and you said, man, that's so good, I believe I'll get saved. You didn't get saved when you sat in a stadium somewhere and watched somebody take a little piece of pig skin with a bunch of hot air in it and kick it up through two uprights and when it went through, you stood up and said, hallelujah, I believe I'll get saved. You didn't get saved watching something on television that's anti-biblical. Let me tell you how you got saved. You got saved by hearing this book that the devil is tampering with. He don't like it because in this book there is a seed. It's called in Peter the uncorruptible word of God. And when that seed is planted in your heart and you allow it to germinate, it will produce salvation in your soul and take you from the earth's worst to heaven's best. It will place your destination in the city four square because this book will make you wise unto salvation. You got saved because you got exposed to this book. It made you wise. It helped you understand your loss. It helped you see there's a Savior who is the Christ who left heaven, came down here, died for you, went back. He's expecting your arrival and has made it possible for you to come there because you, you was made wise through the wise word of God. The scriptures make you wise unto salvation. You know why? Have you ever put your hand in the wrong place when you was plugging the socket, the cord in the socket? Did you ever get your finger slid a little over the front of that thing? It'll light your life up. I'll never, forget, I'll never forget the first shock I got. I was, I, my parents dropped me off. I was going to spend the weekend with my grandparents over in Iredale County. Long dirt road. It had been raining. Boy, it had been raining. Muddy. I'm trying to get around some mud. There's grass on the bank. And there's a fence on that bank. I decided to walk in the grass, get out of the mud, and I got over in that grass, and it was wet, and I started slipping. And I reached over and grabbed a hold of that fence. When I grabbed a hold of that thing, those cosmonauts from Russia never did see as far as I did. I'm here to tell you, it lit me up. I could smell that electricity. It took me a moment to try to figure out what's going on here. It shocked the fire out of me. Thank God those electric fences, they pulsate. It pulses, puts a pulse of electricity there. It breaks it. And, pulls, and when it broke it, I could get loose from it. But I was grounded on a wet ground. I feel sorry for those cows, especially with their wet nose. It was a shocker. You know what the Word of God is? It makes you wise unto salvation. It's a shocker. You know why? Because Hebrews 4.12 says the Bible is alive. It is active. The Word of God will shock you. No other book in the world you hear will have make the impression on you that the Bible will make. You're saved because you got convicted. And it was the Spirit of God that used this book I'm holding in my hand today to convict you of your sin. You didn't get convicted by watching some secular program. You got convicted. You realized you was a sinner. You realized you needed a Savior, and there was one available. Because of the power of this book, it made you wise unto salvation. Now, it taught you that he was approved in heaven. He was approved on earth, and he can be approved in your heart if you'll invite him in. The liberal versions don't want you to know that, but Jesus still saves. He still saves like he's always saved. He's still a complete Savior. That's the reason some of you went home after the preacher got through preaching or you got in your car and you said, honey, I want to ask you a question. You've been talking to the preacher about us. Well, I know, honey, why? Well, he said some things today that he would have only known if somebody had been talking to him. 
No, no. That was the Holy Spirit of God using the Word of God. You see, God's got some inside information. He can deal with these issues, and the preacher will never even know anything about it. You know why? Because there's power in this book. It's a powerful book. If you don't believe that, I'm finished. But if you don't believe this is a powerful book, take it with you on your job tomorrow. Walk in with a big Bible under your arm. They'll brand you immediately. Hey, you got some folks on the job that bothers you? And you just rather they didn't even come around? Here's the answer. You just take this. It'll scare them to death. You go over to a newsstand and get you a Life magazine. Get today's paper and take it with you. Roll it up and put it in the arm and walk in like that. It won't bother. But you walk in with that book under your arm or over your chest, the first thing they're going to do, they're going to give you a double take. They're going to say to them, and the next thing you know, you're going to see a little group of the, the near manuscript evidences over there. They're going to be saying, what's happened to him? You know you're not supposed to have a Bible over here. Why is it in the school they don't want the Bible? It's a powerful book to change their life. The Supreme Court said in, about, in 1980 about the Ten Commandments, they said they've got to come over the wall. Here's what they said. They said if those commandments stay on the wall, those kids might memorize those commandments and do those commandments. Here's the phrase they use. That's not a permissible issue. They said they might, they might follow what those commandments say. We can't have that in this school. Well, they got their wish. They got lead flying everywhere. You know the difference? This Bible will change you because it's a living book. It's the Word of God. There's power in the Word to change your life. Let's don't apologize for it. Let's don't be ashamed of it. Let's hold it up and reverence it. This is, hold it up. Would you just hold your Bible up and just kind of wave it in the face of the devil and just say, hey, let's say it together. This is the Word of God. This is the, let's say it again. This is, amen. Take that, devil. We still believe it around here that it is the Word of God. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Dear Jesus, I want to thank you today that you have left us the, the powerful, powerful word. I want to thank you today that we can still have a Bible that has all of the word that you want us to have in it. Lord, it breaks my heart that they've taken your name out so often in the other versions. It breaks my heart that they've taken the reality of hell out in so many of the other versions. But thank you that you've still left some publishers around and you've still left some people around with enough common sense to know that we don't need part of your word. We need all of your word. And I pray during this invitation you will help us today, Lord, to draw closer to you. And Lord, once again, you said if we can receive the witness of men, we can sure receive your witness because you're greater than men. And thank you today that we can just step out on your word by faith and know what you say is exactly what you'll do. And help us to claim it today. If we need to come to this altar, help us to do so. In Jesus' name. If you've never been saved, he'll save you today. He promised to do it. Hear me well. If you've never been saved, he'll save you. He promised to do it. If you're walking at a guilty distance, come on right now. Get around this altar and let's get it settled. Okay?